Hello everyone, welcome back. Once again, I'm your instructor, Vernon Creviston, and today, believe it or not, we have our final lecture with me. I, I know it seems like a long time and a long way to go here, <laughs> but we finally made it. Now, a couple things I want to let you know. First and foremost, as usual, they're doing some kind of construction around my office, so uh, I apologize for that, but this is really the only time I have to record this lecture, so we're going to have to make the best uh, we can do with this. Um, uh, hopefully make it through this. I'll try to speak as loud as possible, be as close as I can to the camera uh, to try and uh, drown out the noise of construction as best as possible, right? Also, I'm going to try and do this as quickly as possible. Uh, I know I've said that before in previous lectures and they didn't seem short at all. I do apologize for that. I'm going to try and move as quickly as possible as I can through this, uh, but I'll do the best I can, okay? But this lecture is kind of a culmination of things, right? Uh, we are going to be looking at the Reagan administration here. Uh, and kind of its lasting impact on the United States. Uh, that's what we really want to kind of do here. Uh, so I'm not going to really kind of touch on everything. I'm not really not going to get into much in the way of 21st century America here, even though we're 20 years into it now. Uh, but I do want to just kind of show you the foundations of where we are today really do kind of come from the Reagan administration in that period of, of the late, night, or late 20th century. The 1980s really do have a big impact on what's happening uh, today, 30 years later. So to kind of uh, put this into some context and kind of explain what we're doing here and kind of explain why the Reagan administration has kind of this uh, a big impact, maybe outsized impact, right? Kind of uh, remind ourselves of kind of uh, the way America kind of works politically, if you will. Right? I've used this uh, image before, this idea of uh, the political pendulum in the United States, right? It's just really in general in politics and political science. Uh, the right side is more kind of the... Uh, the conservative side of politics uh, generally across the board and on the left side of, of politics is kind of the more liberal side of things, right? Although uh, that's really not the way to think about it because in the United States, we're all liberals, right? We all believe in freedom of speech. We all believe in uh, right to assemble, those kind of things, right? Uh, those, are, those, are, those, are, those are not the things we argue over. It's, it's, it's how government should approach things, how, gov how much power... Uh, different levels of government should have. Those are the things that we kind of uh, argue over politically in this country. So a better way to kind of think of it is kind of the conservative versus uh, progressive sides. That's kind of how we label them here in the 21st century. So that's kind of what we're looking at. And what I want to remind you uh, is kind of what we were looking at over the past couple of lectures, that this country had really shifted in the 60s and even into the early 70s uh, to the more uh, left wing of things, right? The more progressive side of things. Uh, that the, the, the federal government was being used more and more and more to bring more freedom, more uh, rights to different groups of people as they defined it all through the 60s and 70s. But of course, uh, there was a blowback to this. There, 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 there's kind of a, a pushback coming out of the more conservative side of American politics by the 1970s, right? It had been there in the 50s and 60s as well, but it really didn't have much uh, support. But the election of Richard Nixon showed that there were some on the political right side of the spectrum that really kind of wanted things to kind of come back, that they felt things had gone too far to the left in this country. Uh, but when Nixon, who avowed his, himself as, as a conservative, said he was going to bring you know, in kind of this um, the expansion of federal authority is going to going to kind of uh, put things back the way they were. He's going to stop, you know, enforcing z z desegregation, that kind of stuff, right? Limit federal power. Uh, actually, did exactly the opposite. The country had just moved too far to the left. It was just too progressive. Uh, Nixon, an avowed conservative, had to kind of run, uh, kind of run the government as more of a progressive liberal. So. Uh, here during the late 70s, we're going to see that that pendulum is beginning to swing the other way. And that's really what Ronald Reagan's kind of announcement on the political stage in the mid-70s, but really in the early 80s, kind of, kind of tells us, right? This country is beginning to swing back the other way. And really the question now here in the 21st century is how far that pendulum is going to swing. Uh, Reagan kind of begins that pullback, right? So begins that pendulum swinging to the right. And it's carried on since him, even through the 20th century and now into the 21st century, we're swinging to the right in this country. 
The question is how far right. In, our, in the past, our country, this would be about as far as we get, uh, as far as you know, the conservative swing of things, right? Uh, this is about the time where we start swinging back to the left, where we start saying, no, we need government. We need government to do this. We need government to do that. Maybe check the power of corporation, maybe to you know, you know, balance out uh, you know, wealth inequality, that kind of stuff. That's about the time we've always started to swing back. The question here is whether that still holds true or not. Because we could go further to the right. You know, if you look at kind of the, uh, the political spectrum, again, on the left, you have socialism and communism. The United States has never gotten to those extremes, but we've brushed up close on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we've seen extreme uh, right-wing conservatism, uh, even swinging into near fascism. It, it, this country's flirted with it a couple of times, especially during the Great Depression when there were neo-Nazi rallies in the United States and neo-Nazi parties after World War II that emerged, right? So that is definitely possible as well. The question is whether we go there or not. And as I'll try to point out to you at the end of the lecture, it is, it is an open question. We do not know which way this polit polit political pendulum is going to swing here, right? So what we're going to do in this lecture is kind of take a look at uh, the importance of Reagan and how he kind of sets up this swing to the right that's still going on today in, in our country. And we'll do that by taking a, a kind of a, a quick uh, rejoinder to the Carter administration, understanding what his problems were and how they kind of foster this kind of uh, rebirth of the Republican Party. Uh, that Reagan, when he comes into office in 1980, he's really rebuilding a new political party, right? Republican Party of Reagan isn't the party that existed 20 or 30 years before him. Of course, we'll want to look at Reagan's uh, claim to fame, uh, what he does in the Cold War that makes him so popular. And then, of course, we want to kind of look at his shadow, how even uh, presidents after him are kind of influenced by what happens in his administration. So that's kind of what's on, on tap for this, okay? And again, I do admit, yes, we're going to move a little quick here. So uh, feel free to stop and read the screen wherever you need to. All right, so uh, let's kind of remind ourselves about this guy, Jimmy Carter. Now, remember, he's elected in 1976. Uh, he runs against uh, Gerald Ford. Uh, Ford was uh, Nixon's vice president. Uh, Ford has the uh, claim to fame to being the only American president never actually elected to the office of president. Uh, Nixon's first vice president, Spiro Agnew, was caught in a corruption charge and had to resign. So a voice, vice president was appointed because a lot of people knew Nixon was in trouble already with Watergate and that, uh, that they needed to have a plan of succession there. Uh, they needed a vice president. Uh, so uh, Gerald Ford was selected out of the Congress to be that uh, vice president. So uh, when Ford runs in 1976, he finds that the Nixon's legacy of Watergate and the fact that Ford pardoned Nixon for his crimes uh, really left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths, and the country really lurched over to the, to the Democratic Party. Now, interestingly, the Democratic Party still didn't have a, a foregone leader for it, right? Uh, Carter kind of emerges out of nowhere. Uh, people are just tired of politics as usual. They don't trust a lot of the established politicians. Uh, and that tells us that things are not well in our, our, our body politic here in this country. That should have been a big clue to all of us that there were some bad things happening, right? But when uh, Carter becomes president, he's going to have a lot of challenges. Uh, maybe not all of them are his fault, uh, but he doesn't oft often have clear ideas on how to solve them, right? Uh, inflation, which is already a problem in the early 70s under Nixon's administration, has gone rampant by the late 1970s in the end of Carter's administration. 14, 15% inflation, interest rates of 30, 40% sometimes on credit cards, right? Uh, unsustainable costs is what we're looking at. Uh, fueled in part by uh, the Middle East controversies, uh, oil embargoes by OPEC nations, which were largely Arab nations that were always at war with Israel. And they saw the United States as Israel's supporter as a country that had to be dealt with. Uh, so they dealt with us by raising the price of oil, which raised the cost of everything in our nation. So the Carter administration had a lot of challenges economically. It also had international challenges. Uh, when uh, Carter okays that the uh, former ruler of uh, Iran, a strongman, a political dictator by the name of uh, Reza Pahlavi, known as the Shah of Iran, could come to the United States for medical attention for his cancer treatment, uh, the people of Iran were incensed. They wanted him turned over to them for his crimes. He did use secret police, uh, uh, brutal tactics uh, to stay in power, to get rid of his political enemies. Um, 
So there were some legitimate issues over whether we should let this guy in for medical uh, treatment. Carter said, well, we put him in power, we kept him in power, we owe the guy, so we let him in. And in response, people in Iran, in the capital of Iran, Tehran, took over our embassy and held 43 Americans hostages for more than a year. So that made America look politically weak on the world stage, right? Here we are standing up against communism. Here we are, the country that says we're uh, trying to defend people across the world and we can't even defend our own people in the world, right? So again, the Carter administration is beset with a lot of problems. It does have some wins, however. Um, the Carter administration kind of starts de-emphasizing the Cold War, actually. He starts looking at trying to solve problems like the Middle East, trying to get countries like Egypt and Israel that have fought numerous wars since 1948 to quit fighting each other. And he actually gets it to work, right? He gets them to come and meet and, and Camp David and, and outside of Washington, D.C., and come to a peace agreement. So Carter does have some wins here, right? And he also kind of turns around to parts of South America where we have been installing right-wing dictators and supplying uh, military governments uh, throughout the region. He starts saying, look, you're not going to get help from the United States unless you start opening up your country. You start giving people the rights we say we're actually fighting for. So in some ways, Carter does some really big things, right? Uh, he does say that the United States is, is, wants to live up to these ideas we say we're fighting for. Uh, but we have to kind of look past the issues of the Cold War to do that. We don't want communism to spread in South America, but if we don't support countries that, that are right-wing governments, it could happen. So Carter's kind of uh, stuck in a, in a difficult spot here. And then, of course, he has another major international issue, and that, of course, is that the Cold War is still there. He can't ignore it, especially when the Soviet Union invades a neighboring country of Afghanistan in 1979 to bolster, to kind of keep in power a communist uh, government there that's about to be overthrown by kind of uh, religious fundamentalists uh, known as the Taliban. Well, the Russian military uses modern military equipment, things like helicopters, armored personnel carriers, and tanks. Uh, they have mil modern military weapons. Uh, the, these uh, religious fundamentalists, uh, they're riding horses, firing weapons that might be from World War II. They need help to defend the United States. And a lot of people put pressure on the Carter administration to say, look, live up to our ideals. Here's a country under threat of communism. We have to fight back. The Carter administration begins starting to secretly supply the Taliban with modern weaponry so they can fight back against the Soviet Union. But a lot of people feel he's not going far enough. He's not doing enough. And on top of all of this, right, uh, there is kind of a, uh, a movement here, right? There, there's something happening here uh, that somebody like Ronald Reagan is going to be able to take advantage of, right? This disaffection with the way the country's going in the 1970s, that our economy's not doing really well for the first time in a generation, uh, that a lot of Americans feel that the Carter administration just doesn't really have a handle on what uh, things to do. There's these, these other issues, these kind of social issues happening. Remember, as I mentioned in the last lecture, uh, you have people on the religious side uh, of the political spectrum here, the right wing of the political spectrum, that are saying, look, uh, a lot of uh, evangelical, white evangelical Americans are kind of uh, politically conservative. And they feel that the country has gone too far in, 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 in too many different directions. Uh, they don't like this idea of kind of challenging uh, the, the, the norms of society, those, the, those conformist ideals that we said our country is all about in the 40s and 50s. A lot of uh, conservative religious Americans liked those ideals. It was safe. It was knowable. It was them in a lot of ways, right? It's their lives that were considered to be normal. And when you start talking about uh, you know, Jewish people having uh, the same rights as everybody else, when you start talking about uh, African Americans having the same rights as everybody else, gay Americans, women, uh, that, those are challenges to that kind of authority, that idea of what is normal, right? And they, they start pushing back saying, look, we want things to kind of be the way they were in the 40s and 50s. We don't like all of this change. It's not to say that they don't like, uh, uh, you know, the... Uh, civil rights movement, they could support that, but they, they see limits to all of these things, right? That they, they, they don't want too much change. 
allied with them are what are called neoconservatives, people like Arthur Laffer that felt that you know, the United States is kind of uh, needs to fix its economy, that, that, that we need to use our military might on the world stage, that the Carter administration has really kind of lost a handle on all of those things, right? That we spend too much money, the government's too big, too bloated, and doesn't do enough with that, with that tax money, right? That that money could be better used by the individual or maybe by state and local governments. So there's a lot of pushback happening here at the end of, end of the 1970s, uh, and they're really just looking for somebody to kind of uh, bring all this home. And somebody's kind of allied to the, all the, these ideas, right? It'd be somebody like Phyllis Shafley. Uh, she portrays herself as a housewife from Missouri, uh, but really she's been in politics for 20 years already by the 1980s. She is also looking for somebody to kind of put things right. She doesn't like things like the ERA, this women's movement that kind of threatens to upend what is considered to be traditional American household, right? Much like a lot of white evangelicals, uh, Phyllis Shafley sees women as uh, being in the domestic sphere, taking care of the family and the home. She doesn't like the idea of women uh, being told that they have the same exact rights as men. She thinks it's wrong if women go and fight in combat. She, think, she doesn't think it's the right idea for women uh, to be the heads of a household. That's a traditional man's role, in her opinion. So there's a lot of pushback here. She's been incredibly effective as well, right? Just like the moral majority in Jerry Falwell, just like Arthur Laffer and these New York conservatives, Phyllis Shafley has helped stop the Equal Rights Amendment, something that was a foregone conclusion in the late 1960s that would easily pass and become a part of the United States Constitution, that all people, regardless of their sex or gender, have to be treated the same, uh, is dying here in the 1970s because of resistance uh, led by people like Phyllis Shafley. So there is this pushback that's starting here, right? This, this swing to the right has begun. They just need somebody that can kind of galvanize these three groups together, uh, evangelical Christians, uh, these, these neoconservative uh, economic people, and then, of course, kind of your traditional kind of uh, conformist culture uh, of white America. And, of course, they find that in their guy, Ronald Reagan. And in 1980, you can see in this, uh, this electoral map just how sweeping it is. Reagan gets one of the biggest electoral landslides in the history of the country. He gets 90% of the electoral votes. He gets more than half of the uh, popular vote. Uh, Carter, who's running for re-election, only gets 40% of, of the vote. And in something that should be kind of a... a, a, a precursor here should let us know that something is happening. Uh, there are third party candidates getting substantial parts of the vote for the first time since the 1920s. So things are, are starting to happen here politically in, in, in the 1980 election. Uh, you can see that the, the Republican Party really goes after those white evangelical Christians, goes after these uh, you know, fiscal conservatives is what we call these neoconservatives, these people that want to use American military power internationally and people that want to kind of uh, get the economy back on track domestically. And then, of course, you know, kind of appeal to kind of this traditional American middle-class value of white America in the 1980 election. And in Ronald Reagan, these people feel they found their guy. Now, they tried it before with Richard Nixon. They thought that was their guy in 1968, but he wasn't able to deliver on any of those things. Ronald Reagan, on the other hand, is going to be able to deliver. First of all, he's great at communication. He's an actor. He's a former uh, union leader for the Screen Actors Guild. He has a lot of connections in Hollywood. He knows how to kind of portray himself. He's done a good job of it. And, of course, he's portrayed himself as a staunch, staunch anti-communist during the you know, HUAC commissions of the, of the 1940s. He was the one of the first people to name names and kind of say, hey, these are possible communists. Go after them. He's been uh, on the forefront of a lot of these cultural issues. Uh, he doesn't like the idea of uh, forced desegregation. Uh, quietly, he uh, says he's done with, with ending you know, desegregation in the South. He actually announces his candidacy in 1980 in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, the uh, birthplace of the Confederacy, essentially telling white Southerners, I'm not going to push for more civil rights. That's done. 
He comes out and says he's against abortions, which gets uh, white evangelicals on his side. Uh, he rejects the Equal Rights Amendment, which gets people like Phyllis Schafley on his side. Right? He wins a lot of these people over. And then, of course, he says that if he's elected, he's going to cut taxes. He's going to get the economy back on track. He becomes what a lot of people think they want in 1980. So, and again, he kind of uh, harkens back to the 1950s. He, he's somebody knowable. He's been around for a long time. Uh, a lot of people kind of see him as a kindly, grandfatherly figure, much like Eisenhower was in the 1950s. So uh, Reagan appeals to a lot of people here in 1980 America, and it kind of explains why he's so uh, overwhelming as a figure. And then, of course, as I said, he delivers where Nixon didn't. Right? When he gets into office, he actually does start rolling back a lot of these government regulations on businesses. He says that'll stimulate the economy. He says, hey, I'm not going to expand the federal government. As a matter of fact, in his inaugural speech, he says that government's not the answer, government's the problem. Now, that's pretty interesting since the Great Depression, people have been looking to the government to fix problems. And now, Somebody's been elected that says, look, I see government is the problem, not the solution. So this is a big change, and he's going to actually carry through on these things, right? He's going to take on uh, issues like inflation. Uh, now he's going to do it in a really horrible way by giving the country essentially, essentially a recession. Uh, already bad economy gets worse during his first two years. But then inflation does come down. Um, uh, unemployment uh, hits about 10% in 1982, early 1983, but then starts coming down as, as the government starts spending more money. Uh, so he finds a solution here. The, these fiscal conservatives, these neoconservatives, find a way to reduce inflation and uh, spend more government money to stimulate the economy and actually get the economy going again for the first time really since the late 1960s. So in some ways, he, he kind of delivers on everybody, uh, promise, all these promises to these different groups that he's made, right? And one of the areas that is actually one of the most long-lasting uh, contributions to American politics is this idea that you can cut taxes to stimulate the economy. Now, uh, to be fair here, when Nixon, or when, when Nixon comes into office in 1968, uh, the tax rate is somewhere around 60-70% on the top so that meant if you made like a million dollars a year in 1968, you paid around $600,000 in taxes. That is pretty high. But still, the economy was expanding, so I'm not sure if that was really the issue, people paying taxes. But when Reagan comes into office, the tax rate is still around 40-50%. So he decides he's going to cut taxes 25% across the board. doesn't matter how little, how much you make, 25% less goes to the government. Now, uh, people love that, right? Because it means you've got more money in your pocket right away. And that's how these neoconservatives kind of sell it. They say, look, don't let the government spend that money. Let individuals spend that money in their, ho in their hometowns, in their states, and that'll stimulate the economy. Now, there might have been some, some, some reasoning to that when your tax rates are really high, like they were after World War II when it was like 90 or 80 percent, right? Uh, but I'm not sure if that's true uh, when Reagan came into office. Uh, sure, people at the very top that were making millions of dollars a year were paying close to 50%, but most Americans were paying very little, as a matter of fact. So they weren't going to see much of an increase in their monthly uh, monies. Uh, who does are the very rich. And this is when we begin to see kind of this swing, right? Rich people start doing really, really well in the 1980s. Eventually, a lot of people will start doing better economically, but most of the gains are going to go to the richest Americans. And of course, as the Reagan administration starts cutting back on tax revenues, they have to cut back on governmental programs as well. The government's taking in less money, so it needs to spend less money, right? So uh, there's some big things happening here. Now, eventually, the Reagan administration is going to realize uh, that they cut too much, right? 25% was too huge, reduced the federal budget too much, and they're going to turn around and raise taxes multiple times throughout Reagan's presidency, something that a lot of people don't admit about the Reagan administration is that he raised taxes quite a bit, but he never gets them back anywhere close to where it was before he was president. These are all just really small incremental changes to kind of paper over short-term deficits. So the Reagan administration put something in, into play that the Republican Party has been using for the last 
almost 40 years now, or 20 or 30 years now, right? Uh, for, for almost uh, you know, two generations, the Republican Party has always said the answer to any economic problem is cutting taxes. It starts with Reagan because it seemed to work at the time. It's actually more about controlling interest rates than anything else that leads to the, uh, to the economic expansion of the 1980s. And of course, it also has to deal with the fact that Reagan's going to triple the federal deficit, right? We're going to go from about a $1 trillion federal deficit to about $3 trillion under his watch. A lot of that spending is going to help boost the economy as well. But it's really the tax thing that, uh, that he's really remembered. But on uh, top of that, right, he also does what a lot of uh, fiscal conservatives and even, even uh, other groups wanted, and that's have less governmental programs. Uh, you cut back on things like welfare, uh, stop uh, enforcing civil rights legislation, stop forcing companies to make sure that they hire minorities. The federal government's no longer going to be looking over your shoulder, according to Reagan and a lot of his administration. So uh, it does r reduce regulations. It may open up some uh, ec economic activity in the United States, but at the same time, uh, poverty, real poverty in this country goes up for the first time since the 1960s. Remember, uh, Johnson's Great Society program, as expensive as it was, was hugely successful in cutting welfare. And even through the 60s and into the 70s, none of those programs had been done away with. They had all been expanded. And because of that, even during a really hard economic time like the 1970s, a lot of Americans were still out of poverty, uh, more than had been in poverty before, right? Uh, these programs were still working really well in the 1970s. But under Reagan, those programs start getting cut left and right. Poverty actually increases while the economy is getting better for the first time in our history. So that should be also kind of a forewarning that things are not as good as we think they are, right? Now, on the flip side, uh, some things that uh, Reagan does that are kind of uh, maybe against uh, the grain here, especially in this later version of conservatism that we see today. Uh, Reagan's actually going to work on immigration bills. He's going to give uh, paths to citizenship, is what we would call it today, uh, for people that came into the country as undocumented or what we refer to as illegal immigrants, people that just kind of came in without saying anybody that they were coming. Uh, so Reagan actually does find ways to kind of work with people. He, he does understand that uh, they're here anyways. They, these people are working. We might as well have them be fully contributing to the economy rather than kind of a hidden kind of a, a black market side of the economy. So Reagan can do some things that are kind of against type, if you will. Uh, but usually they have to do with uh, boosting the economy more than anything else, right? But to kind of get back to something I want to, I want to point out to you. Uh, that I said earlier, uh, when, Re when Reagan cuts uh, the tax rate, it really does help one part of America more than any other. Uh, the poorest Americans, those who are in the poverty level, actually see things get worse for them because there's less government spending to help them. Uh, the, what we would today call the lower class uh, also depends a lot on those programs, those social programs like welfare and food stamps, that kind of stuff. Uh, they also see kind of a, a shrinking in their income and in their standard of living. Uh, what we would kind of, kind of call middle class America sees a slight uptick in their uh, standard of living because they have a little bit more disposable income uh, from lower taxes. But who sees the biggest benefit by far, maybe double, triple what any other part of the American economy sees or the American uh, uh, taxpayer uh, sees are the wealthiest Americans. So here, in a very real way, in the Reagan administration, the rich get richer and everybody else just gets a little or nothing or maybe even less than they, they got before, right? So definitely kind of a, an inequality is starting to creep into American economics uh, that hadn't been there for a long time, right? Since the Gilded Age of the late 19th century. So Reagan is kind of really kind of uh, rebranding things in, in a lot of ways. Uh, he's talking a lot like conservatives did in the early 1920s, right? I mean, that's when he was a kid. That's the message he remembers, right? Uh, people like Herbert Hoover in the Great Depression saying, hey, look, don't look to the government. If the government comes in and does things for you, you'll lose liberty. You'll lose uh, individual uh, power. You don't want that. So just take care of yourself, right? Kind of that laissez-faire idea. Well, Reagan's trying to kind of rebrand that, kind of rekindle that idea here in 1980s America, and it's starting to actually take root. 
So he kind of puts into, into place what we would today call the modern conservative movement, uh, that when conservatives are in government and have control of the government, they should reduce taxes anytime there's an economic problem, and we've seen them do that every single time that they should reduce regulation whenever possible uh, to, to try and stimulate the economy. Now, in reality, it never actually does that. Uh, there are very, very few times do regulations actually stimulate the economy, uh, but it does make it possible for really very powerful corporations uh, to take over other corporations because there's less regulation. Another thing that uh, uh, kind of comes out of the Reagan administration that becomes the norm for Republican Party politics uh, for the future is the fact that to kind of make sure social conservatives like the moral majority or people like Phyllis Shafley stay on board, uh, they start appointing judges who interpret things very narrowly, very conservatively, uh, that don't, don't like all these changes to American society, that don't push for government intervention in civil rights or uh, gender equality that or, uh, or you know gay marriage, gay rights rights uh, side of things, people that are kind of going to limit all of those changes. So in kind of in a very big way, Reagan is the one that kind of starts modern republicanism, what we understand to be as a Republican Party today. It is all put in place under him. Now we are going to kind of turn really quick to the one thing that Reagan is given a lot of credit for, and that of course is winning the Cold War. Now the first thing I want to say is he does a lot uh, uh, to, to make this, uh, this thing called containment finally pay off, that to bring the kind of Cold War to a close. But do remember that this thing has been going on for 40 years when Reagan comes into office. It is not anything new. He is one of many presidents that's had, a, had to deal with this and had, to, you know, had a chance to kind of put his imprint on it. Uh, he just has the, uh, the luck of being the last guy to have to really deal with this in, in a very real way, right? Uh, and, 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 and maybe one the clearest way to understand this is Reagan is the one that's going to push over a system that was already toppling, right? Uh, Carter probably could have done this. Uh, actually, as a matter of fact, Carter is going to kind of start this process when he starts aiding uh, Afghan people against the, uh, the Russians that are invading Afghanistan. Uh, if the Carter administration had been more... Uh, more willing to use American political power that way, or military power that way, had been more willing to kind of extend American military power and force the Soviet Union to match it, uh, this probably would have happened under his watch as well, right? So the Reagan, Reagan kind of is opportunistic, and that doesn't mean to, to belittle what he's doing. It just means that he senses opportunity and he takes advantage of it, right? He sees, he senses that the Soviet Union's weak and he pushes them hard and they collapse because of it, right? So that's what part we're going to look at right now is kind of his, his, his contribution to the Cold War, right? And of course, he has a very famous moment, uh, Reagan does. Much like uh, Kennedy had at the beginning of his presidency, near the end of Reagan's presidency, uh, Reagan goes to Berlin. And there he has that famous speech in front of the Brandenburg Gate where he dares the communist uh, system right, to tear down the Berlin Wall. He says, why do you need a wall to keep your people in? If you need a wall to keep your people in, it means your system doesn't work. And he dares them to take him down. Right. He says, look, we're not coming to take you out. If we wanted to, we already would have done it. The only reason you have that wall is because you want it not to protect you from us. Right. But to keep your people in, to keep them from coming over to us. So here in 1987, you see Reagan kind of uh, uh, challenges the Soviet Union again. Right. Much like Kennedy had in, in the early 1960s, Reagan's kind of announcing the United States is back in the business of opposing communism, of challenging the Soviet Union. He'd actually been doing that since he was inaugurated in 1981. He'd been constantly branding the Soviet Union as an evil empire, constantly saying communism is a massive threat. He uh, launched an uh, invasion of a small... Uh, island in the Caribbean called Grenada uh, that was taken over by uh, Cuban communists and other communist groups uh, actually didn't really have much in the way of any uh, geopolitical meaning to it, uh, but there were some American uh, medical students at a school there, uh, so he used that as a pretext and sent in American uh, military forces to kind of uh, safeguard those uh, students. There was some threat to their safety. 
So he used American power to say, look, we're going to do whatever we need to do to stop communism and to protect our people. And it really responded, uh, the American public responded well to that. He seemed to have a grip on things more than the uh, Carter administration or even the Nixon administration did. Uh, Reagan, in a very real way, made using American power uh, acceptable again, right? Since the Vietnam War, a lot of Americans didn't want to use American military power, but Reagan is willing to do that. So here in the, in the Reagan administration, he's building up the military for the first time since the 1960s, right? Uh, he's spending a lot of money on new weapon systems for the United States, uh, expanding military power across the board. Uh, he's going to spend more, uh, 50 percent more than both the Ford, Ford or Carter administrations have been willing to spend on military uh, uh, supplies and, and ordinances. Of course, that comes at a, at a tremendous cost. He's going to triple the, the federal uh, deficit because of this. But when Reagan starts spending all this on the military uh, establishment, right, the Soviet Union has to respond. They have to be able to kind of step up and say, okay, we can match this, the United States. If they have five or six uh, aircraft carriers, we'll have a couple. If they have 50 or 60 nuclear weapons, we have to have 50 or 60 nuclear weapons. If they're invading a country, we have to support that country, right? So in a very real way, Reagan is kind of going back to the kind of the tried and true uh, policies of containment that were established under, uh, under uh, Truman and been kind of carried out all the way up to him. And very much in a very real way, he says that, look, the Soviet Union is an enemy that needs to be dealt with. There are TV shows that portray and movies that portray the Soviet Union as the enemy, that they're coming to get us. And the Reagan administration uses that kind of sentiment to justify this big uh, military uh, buildup in the United States. And then he starts using that military power in a lot of different ways. One of those is to try and roll back communism wherever possible, but especially in the Western Hemisphere, in places like Grenada, that small island in the Caribbean, and in the country of Nicaragua. Nicaragua, under the Carter administration, had gone over to a socialist, maybe even a, a communist government. But there were right-wing forces in the Central American country of Nicaragua that wanted to push back, that wanted to, to get rid of those socialists uh, out of power and take control. Now, the United States uh, Congress had said, no, we're not going to get involved in Central America. Too many times we've gotten involved and supported the wrong people. We don't want to do that. The Carter administration said, we're staying out. Let the people of Nicaragua decide this. Reagan decides, no, we're going to get involved anyways. And even though Congress has passed laws saying you can't get involved, he's going to. He's going to have one of his national security advisors, a decorated Vietnam vet by the name of Oliver North. He's going to put him in charge. He's going to say, raise money secretly, send it to these, uh, these, these uh, right-wing uh, fighters in Nicaragua and help them kick the communists out of Nicaragua. Well, this guy Oliver North does that by selling weaponry to Iran a country that had just held Americans in, as hostages for almost uh, two years. Uh, so it's kind of a weird, uh, a weird thing, right? But it definitely circumvents the laws that Congress had passed. This eventually comes out, and it becomes known as the Iran-Contra gate. After Watergate, every scandal politically is known as a gate of some kind. Well, this is Contra gate, right? And in this, uh, the Reagan administration should have gone down for this. Reagan should have been impeached and removed for office for violating laws, laws that were signed into effect, right, by the Carter administration. But Reagan doesn't. A lot of his subordinates, people like Oliver North, step up and say, the president didn't know, I did it, punish me, send me to jail. So in a very real way, Reagan kind of uh, gets a loyalty that his, uh, that Nixon's uh, people didn't show Nixon, right? Uh, uh, Oliver North and a bunch of people in the Reagan administration go to jail, lose their jobs uh, because they did something illegal. But Reagan, because he's so popular, he's seen as being such a strong leader, uh, a lot of people are willing to give Reagan the benefit of the doubt. And even Democrats in Congress don't feel that they can impeach him. So it kind of shows you just how far the country is starting to swing back the other way here politically, that the Republican Party is very popular here in the 1980s, so popular that a Republican president can actually break the law, do something illegal, just like Richard Nixon, and not pay a political price for it, right? And kind of culminating all this, uh, Reagan has one of his big moments in 1988. 
uh, he decides to meet with the new uh, leader of the Soviet Union, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. And he uh, wants to meet with Gorbachev to kind of do something that had been done several times, especially since the, uh, the Nixon administration, but that's limit uh, nuclear weapons. And they meet in Reykjavik in uh, Iceland in 1987, I believe, late 1987, early 1988. And they meet there, and while they're kind of dis discussing how to kind of limit the number of uh, nuclear weapons and kind of lessen tensions between the United States at this time, United States and Soviet Union, at this time, Russia really needs uh, to try to have a friendly relationship with the United States because their economy is collapsing in the, in the 1980s. Uh, the Russian communist system just isn't working anymore. The Russian people just don't agree with it. They don't uh, see it as legitimate, and they're definitely not operating as a, in a uh, cohesive fashion anymore. Uh, the Soviet government just can't get things done. So there's a lot of pressure on the Soviets to come to the table and meet with Reagan, even though he's called them out as the enemy, as a danger to the world. Uh, they need to find some kind of understanding with the United States. So when they meet in 1988, uh, what comes out of this is Reagan decides this is a good chance to do something he's actually thought about for a long time. Uh, maybe just get rid of all nuclear weapons whatsoever. Uh, the United States just doesn't need them anymore. We can defend ourselves militarily with all of our normal conventional weaponry. We don't need nuclear weapons to keep Russia from attacking us or our allies. And he basically says that to the Russian leader, Mikhail Gorbachev. He says, let's get rid of all of our nuclear weapons. That way the world's a safer place. We don't need them. You shouldn't need them. If you're really as big and powerful as you say you are, you don't need them either. Let's just do it. Well, in reality, Russia does need those nuclear weapons because that's what they think will keep the United States from attacking them. So they can't take the offer up, and it makes the United States look even more powerful. And then something comes out of this. When, when it becomes known that, that Reagan made this offer, that there was this idea that the United States is powerful and, and it's Russia that's really the weak country here, uh, the Russian empire, the Soviet empire, starts collapsing. Germany starts talking about leaving the Soviet you know, sphere of influence, reunifying with the rest of Germany. Poland has already had a series of arrest, uh, uh, of kind of unrest in the 1970s. It formally starts saying it's leaving the Warsaw Pact. It's no longer under control of the Soviet Union. Russia begins to collapse as, a, as an empire. Reagan, in a very real way, helps push all of that over by building up the military, by putting pressure on the Soviet Union to respond economically to the United States' growing economy in the 1980s. Uh, the Soviet Union just can't do it, right? It falls apart. And Reagan, in a very real way, uh, can claim that he helped win the Cold War. But he didn't do it alone, obviously. And that's the one thing we have to kind of remember. This is a 40-year-long struggle. It doesn't happen in just a couple of years. Uh, this has a, a, been a long road in the making here. Now, the thing I want to end with here, and I am going to go super quick here, so I apologize for this. I know I haven't been as quick as I said I was going to be, but I am going to go pretty quick here, is kind of the lasting legacy to see just how the things that Reagan puts in, in, in place in the 1980s kind of carries on into the 1990s and actually even into today, right? And that, of course, is to turn to Reagan's vice president, George H.W. Bush, who runs for his own uh, presidency in 1988 after Reagan leaves office. Um, and he's going to essentially run as a, uh, as a third term of Reagan. Uh, he was a critic of Reagan in 1980, uh, but he joined as, as Reagan's vice president, and he's kind of towed the line of the modern Republican Party. Reduce taxes, reduce regulations, and kind of uh, go for a more conservative uh, side to American uh, domestic policies. And uh, at first, he's seen as a pretty, uh, a pretty popular president, right? Again, he's kind of seen like a, another version of Reagan, if you will. They come from the same generation. They have the same basic way of kind of uh, portraying themselves. And a lot of Americans were pretty, uh, pretty much behind uh, Bush uh, during his uh, first uh, few years in office. But near the end of his uh, first term, or his only term, actually, uh, he does get an international crisis that um, makes or breaks a lot of presidencies. And in his case, it should have made his presidency. It should have easily gotten him a second term. 
right? And that's when the country of Iraq invades one of its neighboring countries called Kuwait in 1991. Now, this is kind of a challenge here at the end of the Cold War as to whether the United States is still kind of the undisputed leader in the world and whether it will use that power that it has. Uh, a lot of people were wondering, now that the Cold War is over, what does that mean? Does the United States, you know, once the Soviet Union starts collapsing in the late 80s, what happens? Well, George H.W. Bush has been kind of guiding that process. Remember, Reagan kind of makes it happen uh, you know, when it does, uh, but then he's out of office in 1988. It's George H.W. Bush that actually has to kind of navigate this process of how to reunify Germany, how to kind of... Uh, uh, reestablish independent countries in, in uh, the Eastern Europe, like Poland and Hungary, Czechoslovakia, what happens now? Well, he's been kind of dealing with that. But suddenly, there's another international crisis, and that's the first Gulf War. The country of Iraq evades at Kuwait, what it considers to be part of its country. It wants the oil revenue that Kuwait gets. The leader of Iraq, Saddam Hussein, needs money. He wants to attack his uh, neighboring country of Iran. He's been at war with them for several years. This is a quick way for him to get some money to keep the war going. So he invades his neighboring country. In response, George H.W. Bush gets almost the entire rest of the world on the side of the United States and goes in and liberates Kuwait and basically destroys the Iraq army. Bush is seen as a hero across the United States and actually uh, many parts of the world see this very positively. Here's a, a moment of American leadership. We step in on the national state on the international stage and kind of restore order. That's a, what a lot of people think the United States' job now is, to keep order in the world so that the economies of all the world can, can move forward, so that the, everybody's kind of a standard of living can rise. That's kind of the promise that the end of the Cold War brings to a lot of people. But what happens is by 1992, uh, this guy that should be a very popular president and easily win re-election uh, has a big problem. Uh, the problem is that the American economy is going through a short recession, right? A lot of those policies that Reagan had done were very expensive. Well, George H.W. Bush actually thinks that maybe we shouldn't be spending all of this money on new, on on weaponry and, and, and all these uh, different domestic policies, right? Let's just pull back on government spending. Well, he also needed to raise taxes to kind of balance the federal budget. Nick, uh, Reagan never worried about balancing the budget. That's why he tripled the federal deficit. Well, Bush wants to be a true conservative and not add so much debt to the national government. So he raises taxes and cuts government spending, especially military spending, which leads to a recession. Now, it shouldn't have been a big deal. Actually, by 1992, we're starting to come out of the recession. But something interesting happens. Somebody that's even more conservative by Bush, a guy by the name of Pat Buchanan, we would today call him a political pundit, one of these people that you see on TV kind of talking about politics all the time. He decides to run against his own party's president, right? Uh, he says Bush isn't being conservative enough. He lied. He raised taxes when he said he wouldn't raise taxes, right? That's what a, a conservatives think now. Government doesn't raise taxes. It always lowers taxes. And Pat Buchanan says Bush isn't doing enough on uh, prayer in schools. Bush isn't doing enough to roll back gay rights. Bush isn't doing enough to roll back uh, civil rights. Pat Buchanan comes out as a very, very conservative person, and he actually starts getting people to vote for him. So in 1992, there's a scary moment for the Republican Party. Uh, George H.W. Bush, a very conservative person, isn't conservative enough for a, for a big minority of the Republican Party. Now, in the end, Bush is able to kind of hold on to political power in the Republican Party. But it does show that a lot of people feel the Republican Party hasn't gone conservative enough here in the 1990s. And it opens the door to a third party candidate, right? Uh, his name is Ross Perot, uh, but he's not the only candidate, right? The Democratic Party finds somebody kind of, once again, unlikely, right? Uh, the uh, Governor of the state of Arkansas, little known politically in the United States by the name of Bill Clinton, somehow gets the party's nomination in 1992. 
And we kind of see a moment here in, in America politically, right? Uh, Bush isn't particularly popular amongst most uh, conservatives. They just feel he's not conservative enough. Um, also, the fact that the economy isn't doing particularly well during the 1992 uh summer uh, means a lot of people are willing to look at somebody else. After all, Republicans have been in charge for 12 years now. And the fact is that a third-party candidate, a, a Texas billionaire, an oil billionaire by the name of H. Ross Perot, decides to run as an alternative to George Bush. So that opens the door for the uh, Democrats and their kind of uh, charismatic, younger kind of generation, Bill Clinton. He was a protester of the uh, Vietnam War, uh, very liberal on a lot of policies, very uh, supportive of civil rights agendas and equal rights and all those things, things that the Democrats had been very much for the last 20 years or so. He says he's for, and he wants to push through if he's made president. So in 1992, uh, Clinton wins, not because most of the country loves Democrats, but because the re re conservative side of American politics can't make up its mind who to support, H. Ross Perot or George Bush. So because the conservative, uh, <coughs> excuse me, because the conservative vote is split, uh, Clinton is able to win the presidency. But that doesn't mean Clinton has a lot of support, and he's going to notice that along the, the road here. When he becomes president of the United States, Clinton isn't going to be able to do a lot of the things he wants to do. Democrats have been talking about for since Truman of uh, kind of reforming the health care system in the United States, giving free national paid, you know, government paid health care to Americans. He tries to put the first lady, Hillary Clinton, in charge of it. It gets voted down by conservative uh, Republicans, but also members of his own party who are conservative. He tries to end the ban on gays in the military that has been going on in this country since officially the 1950s. That fails. Once again, Democrats, his own party, won't support that uh, legislation. So we kind of see this country really has moved to the right here. Things that Democrats would have done in the 1960s can't get done here in the 1980s and early 1990s. There's just no uh, political willpower for it. On the other hand, uh, the Republicans can get things done. Uh, they uh, nominate a new speaker for the Republican Party in the United States Congress and the House of Representatives, Newt Gingrich, and he basically says, we're going to stop uh, spending so much money. Uh, so he has a budget battle with Clinton, says we're going to limit the uh, size of the federal deficit and shuts down the government on it. He wants more tax breaks for Americans. He wants more Americans to have uh, investment opportunities, make more Americans able to invest in the stock market. So the Republican Party gets what they want, but the Democratic Party can't get what it wants, even when the Democrats in the White House. Again, it shows just the power of the Republican Party here in the 80s and 90s. And then, of course, the Clinton administration has to go through with a lot of other things. Uh, Republicans want uh, more trade with international uh, groups, especially in North America with uh, Canada and Mexico. They're able to push through a thing called NAFTA. Uh, Democrats and Bill Clinton go along with it, even though they don't like some of the components of it. But that Republican policy becomes the Clinton administration policy. Uh, they want to start limiting welfare, and they push back, they push through more and more limits on welfare, and again, it gets done, even though a lot of Democrats don't like it, and even though a Democrat's in the White House. So you kind of see, um, sort of like Nixon ran as a conservative, but, but, but ran the country as a liberal. Clinton's kind of the opposite. He runs as a very liberal person, but most of his policies end up becoming very uh, conservative, not because he's conservative, but because that's what's politically supported right now. His own party has a lot of conservative Democrats in it, and they won't go along with the things that Clinton wants. The only things they'll agree with are things that the Republicans want. So in some ways, uh, the Clinton presidency is very much a Republican uh, presidency because it's Republicans that control a lot of it. Clinton remains president because the economy bounces back in the 1990s, and we have a massive technology boom in this country that fuels even more uh, economic expansion, and he's able to do a lot of things uh, to keep himself popular that way. So what we kind of see is this, uh, this beginnings of this, uh, this rollback, if you will. And you'll see it here on this in the next few slides, right? 
the, the Clinton administration can't stop this pendulum swing, right? They try, but they fail. In the end, this conservative sweep just keeps growing. Uh, Roe versus Wade is a, a Supreme Court decision in 1972 that says women have the right to get abortions. But by the end of Clinton's administration, about half the country has more uh, strict laws against abortion than they did before his presidency. By the 2010s, in the next Democratic president's uh, administration, states are passing even more restrictive uh, policies or laws against abortion. So we kind of see that this, uh, what starts in the Reagan administration doesn't end with Reagan. It actually continues to carry and pick up steam throughout the 20th century and into the beginnings of the 21st century. Another thing to kind of notice is this rollback in federal intervention, this rollback in federal uh, domestic uh, assistance, uh, welfare programs as we call it, right, starts having a real impact as well. As Republicans kind of keep control of domestic policies and keep rolling back the Great Society programs of the 1960s, we see that, that uh, poverty becomes a real thing in this country again. Not that it had ever disappeared, but it's doubled, tripled in some parts of the country, especially those parts of the country that are very conservative, that are trying to get rid of government control, government taxes as much as possible. The lower South, right? The places like Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, some of the poorest states in the country, they've rolled back their taxes. They've followed this, uh, this uh, conservative mantra of no taxes, no government, and uh, their poverty has skyrocketed. In places like Louisiana, where, where, un, where uh, poverty had always been a big issue, right? Uh, West Virginia, where poverty was, was synonymous with what it meant to live in West Virginia. Half the population of West Virginia in the 1930s was impoverished, lived in poverty. Well, the Great Society program had knocked that down to about 10, 15 percent, right? That is a tremendous uh, shift in 30 years. But by the 1990s, one out of four people living in West Virginia, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, was once again in poverty. So we kind of see this conservative swing. It is real, it is powerful, and it is ongoing, right? And then something else happens. At the same time all of this is taking place, the Republican Party, this more conservative version of itself, starts doing something else starts passing voter register restriction programs. Things like you have to have a, an ID, a state-issued ID, state-issued IDs that cost money. Now, previously in the 60s and 70s, conservatives had tried to do that, especially in the South, to try and keep minorities from voting. Minorities that were often poor and couldn't afford things like cars didn't need driver's license. Driver's licenses cost money. So places like Mississippi and Alabama said, to vote, you have to show your driver's license so we can uh, check your identity. Well, in the 60s and 70s, the Supreme Court said that's illegal because it costs money to get those IDs. That's a version of a poll tax. You have to pay to vote. Well, here in the 2000s, because of all these judges being appointed under Reagan and uh, Bush, and then uh, the second Bush, right, George W. Bush, uh, those conservative judges started saying, no, it's perfectly okay to have people have to have ID, even if they have to pay for that ID to vote. Even though nothing in the 15th Amendment says you have to have an ID to vote. It just says you have to be a citizen, right? So these are big questions that the country has to answer, has to figure out. And what we kind of see is uh, the Republican Party is providing their answers, their way of dealing with all of this all through this period, regardless of whether a Democrat or Republicans in office, these things are getting done uh, by Republican politicians, either on the state or the national level, depending on when they're in charge of these different places. So to kind of leave you with a few last thoughts here, uh, again, the question is, how far to the right are we going to go? Uh, how long is Reagan's shadow here? Well, take these two quotes uh, in mind here as we as we think about that. Uh, the first one is from a current member of the uh, United States Senate. He's a Republican from Iowa, and he's been in the Senate since Reagan, right? And Chuck Grassley is his name, and he said this, right? I, I think not having the estate tax recognizes the people that are investing as opposed to those that are just spending every darn penny they have, whether it is on booze or women. 
Now, what we're talking about here is one of the things that the Republican Party has been talking about since Reagan is the fact that when people die, there is an inheritance tax. It's usually only on people that have very large estates, like a, like a Rockefeller when he dies. Uh, he would pay a huge tax, right? His heirs would lose a lot of that inheritance to the federal government. The thinking is uh, they're just kids. They're just uh, survivors. Uh, they didn't actually do anything to make that money. Therefore, anything they get is bonus, right? Uh, well, a lot of Republicans said, no, that's their family's money. They should have it, not the federal government. So they've been bringing the estate tax down for decades now. But by the early 2010s, just a few years ago, the Republican Party's to the point where they say there shouldn't be any inheritance tax whatsoever. So if you're the children of Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos, the Republican Party says, you, their inheritors, should get all of their money, even if it's hundreds of billions of dollars. Even though you didn't have anything to do with making that money, it is your money because it belonged to your parents. Now, Democrats aren't saying you can't have some of that money. They're just saying you can't have all of it. And what we're seeing from Grassley is the fact that he says, no, you sh the government should have zero of it. They want less government. But then there's something else here that I want to unpack and let you look at. He says that the reason that, that this estate tax should go away is because that people that don't have anything to pass on to their children uh, spent all their money on booze or women. Now think about that. He's saying that if, you don't, if your parents don't leave you any money, don't leave you anything, that it's your parents' fault and it's your fault for not spending your money the right way. It's not because you're poor. It's not because you lived in a really poor state or that you weren't able to get an education, that it's your fault. That is a very old idea. We looked at that back in the Gilded Age when people like Russell Conwell said, if you're not rich, that's your fault. Well, that's come back into vogue. Reagan brings those ideas back into, into, into kind of the limelight, if you will. And it's become entrenched in the Republican Party once again. This is why we call this the Second Gilded Age. The next thing is maybe the more troubling part of this, right? It is not that a Republican politician would say the things Republican politicians have been saying for 30 years, but what Republican voters are starting to say, right? Uh, one Republican uh, voter from Alabama said this in December of 2017 when she voted for one very conservative uh, nominee for the U U.S. Senate from Alabama. She said they still haven't gotten the message, and she's talking about politicians in general, even a year after we sent President Trump to Washington, the Republican Party has gone too far to the left. Now, I want you to stop and think about that, right? Uh, this Republican voter is saying that the Republican Party of 2010, 2016 is too liberal, that it's not conservative enough. So the question here is, how far to the right are we going to swing? Just what is going to happen to our country? Do we go to an extreme level of, of, of right-wing politics that we've never really seen in a, in, in a very real way in this country? Or are we going to start swinging back to the left? Is this time for a reaction the other way now? That is the question to answer. That's what we have to kind of look at to the future. History doesn't really predict the future. It just kind of t explains what happened in the past and why it happened. And that's what we've been doing here today. All right, so believe it or not, we've come to the end here. I know I said it was going to be done quick, and I wasn't, but still, we're, we're at the end here. So some things to kind of think about, right? Uh, the 60s and 70s very much uh, brings back into center place of American life some problems that we've always had, uh, racial issues, minority rights, economic challenges, and, of course, the occasional military setback now in, in the last half of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, how do we deal with that, right? How, how do we kind of get, by, uh, get, get around these things? How do we answer these problems? And what we find out is that that older generation of Americans uh, that were very interested in solving these problems in the 60s and 70s, uh, they quit wanting to solve those problems in the 80s and 90s, right? That baby boomer generation, that huge generation of Americans, uh, they kind of split in the Reagan administration, right? Some of them like what Reagan's saying, some of them don't. But a lot of them, 
they want to have that more conservative uh, view of America, that very familiar conformist view of America from the 40s and 50s. Uh, uh, conservatives, once again, begin selling themselves as saying that you want less government because if there's more government, you lose personal liberties. We see that today on the television screens all the time. People saying that if the government has power, you don't. Well, FDR said during the Great Depression, we actually can do both because you, the voter, get to decide how much power that government can really have. But conservatives have kind of rolled back the other way. Uh, they've said that the best thing to do is get rid of government as much as possible, which means cut taxes, cut regulations, get rid of federal interference wherever possible. And when needed, use American military power anywhere out there in the world to hold on to, uh, up, to keep up American interests, to protect American interests. And that's kind of where the operating pattern we've been in since the 1980s. The last 30, 40 years have been dominated by this, I, these ideals. The question is whether we keep going this direction or not. All right. So thank you very much for listening to all this. Thank you very much for uh, taking the class. And if uh, anytime you need to get hold of me, you know how to do so. All right. Thank you very much.